So hi everyone, um, it's great to have all of you here. Um, it's great that you're actually having me. It's my first time in Goa and I, I really appreciate the hospitality, thanks for that. As you might have noticed, I shortened the title of my talk a bit on my slide so that it could fit. Um, but we're talking about Windows development environments how to attack them with a lot of focus on COM, the component ob object model. Um, this will be a talk from a Red Teamers perspective, but I'll explain a bit uh, about that later in my talk. Um, about me, really short, um, I work at this boutique firm in the Netherlands. We do some really hardcore red teaming and, um, and attack simulation. Most of my previous research is on MS Office. Um, you might know Evil Clippy, a tool which I've written for VBA stomping. But today we're not going to touch upon MS Office. It will be completely different. So what are we going to do today? Um, today we will learn that if you work with a integrated development environment like Visual Studio, that's even compiling or reverse engineering or only just viewing code, just only opening a project, can be just as dangerous as running untrusted code. Which means that we're going to dive into Visual Studio, COM, type libraries, monikers, and if we have some time left, there's a bonus around Mark of the Web, which is more or less related to this. <coughs> So how did I get into this research? Who of you are using Visual Studio on a regular basis? Can I see some hands, please? Okay, that's quite a lot of you. Then probably you have seen this warning message when you opened a project at least once or twice. I regularly get to see this because I used to download a lot of stuff from GitHub and just work from network shares. And whenever you do that, you get this warning message. You should only open projects from a trustworthy source. Okay. Um, and for quite some time, I was like, okay, um, why? But then I started to dig into the security message. And I tried to digest it. And it says, well, if it's not fully trusted, then it could present a security risk by executing custom build steps when opened in Microsoft Visual Studio. And I actually think that that text is a little bit misleading, especially because of the word build steps, because you might be thinking that this is just upon building a project that it can be dangerous, but it turns out that there is much more happening under the hood of an integrated development environment like Visual Studio than I was initially thinking. So. Today we're going to find out what this message actually means and what the attack surface is of Visual Studio from a Red Teamer's perspective. Why do we even want to know that? Well, simply, um, if we're trying to get an initial foothold into a network and we want to target a developer, then a developer who is a little bit technically savvy, then probably your go-to mechanisms like a mac macro in a malicious document um, or an HDA file, that, that doesn't really work with developers. So we're going to developers with their, with their own tools, with their own weapons, which is Visual Studio. So enough of the introduction, we are going down the rabbit hole. <coughs> and this rabbit hole, it started in 2009. <coughs> there was this great security researcher from Hong Kong, Yang Yu, known by his Twitter handle, Tom Keeper. Um, and he posted in Chinese a message with code which was more or less like this on a forum and he explained that compiling this stuff is really dangerous. <laughs> it's not about running this code, running this code is just fine. It will just print hello world and do nothing more than that, but compiling this code is dangerous. And I want you to take a few seconds to have a look at this code and figure out where it is. Well, since it's not that complicated, of course it must be in D import statement. <laughs> so the import statement over here, I'm importing some file. I'll explain what it is in a second. Um, in this case, from a local directory, but you can also host it on a UNC pad, or it could be on WebDAV, or whatever you want to host it. Um, so what is this, this import preprocessor directive that, that, that I've used here? Let's go and have a look at the documentation. This is what the Microsoft documentation says on the import directive. It says it is used to incorporate information from a type library. And this type library is then converted into C++ classes describing COM interfaces. Um, 
If you're not that familiar with COM and type libraries, you might really be thinking, what? Um, but basically, when the Microsoft C++ compiler sees an import directive, it will call load typelib. And I see some of you who might be familiar with load typelib and others are looking like, what, load typelib? So before we go into more details, let's do a step back and let's start to have a look at what is load typelib. To understand type libraries and the function used for loading type libraries, which is load type lib, we need some basics around COM. And this is not going to be a, a beginner's presentation on, uh, on COM, but I do need to introduce some basics for you to understand the rest of the story. <laughs> so the component object model. Um, the whole idea is that it allows you to extract implementations for components that might be different, uh, might be written in different languages like C++, C Sharp, uh, VB, Java, whatever is there. So you have two components uh, or, or, or one client using a component and that client that wants to use that component, it wants to call methods on it. And well, methods in COM interfaces are used to abstract from the implementation of a uh, specific method. How does this work in memory? In memory, it works with a concept called virtual tables, or V tables in short. If you're a C++ programmer, you are more than familiar with, uh, with virtual tables. Um, but how does it work? So if you have code and you have a pointer to a object in your COM client, then the pointer to that COM object, it just points to a block of memory and this block of memory, it holds some private object data, uh, reference counters and such. Um, but the first thing in that object is another pointer to a V table. And that V table somewhere in memory is just a table of pointers again, which points to the actual implementations of those functions. And every COM object in this interface, it is always derived from I unknown, which is like the mother of all COM interfaces, which means that the three methods of I unknown, query interface, add ref, and release are always there. And then there are other methods depending on what the COM object is. <laughs> um, so in summary, COM objects, interfaces, but then the big question is, if you have a COM client and you want to call methods, on a certain object which offers a certain interface, then how does the COM client know what the interface looks like? There is basically two directions that you can take here. Um, there's the iDispatch interface, which is a standard interface um, which has some methods which allow you to query what kind of methods you can call and there's a special method which allows you to call methods via a dispatch table. If you have ever written any JavaScript, VB script, or VBA macros, then you will have experience with this iDispatch interface. Because anytime when you declare an object, just as dim as object, and not as a specific interface, you will be using the iDispatch interface under the hood. We call it late binding in Visual Basic. <laughs> This is all nice, but it really causes significant overhead and performance penalties, because we're putting a method in between for calling other methods. It, it's, it's complicated, performance is really terrible. <laughs> so especially if you want to have really performing code, um, you need to have the interface definitions either at compile time or later when, when the program is running. Um, and for C++, it's kind of easy. Because the whole concept of V tables basically maps to how C++ works. Um, if you know abstract classes and pure virtual functions, well, most C++ compilers will simply directly compile it into V tables, which makes it completely compatible with COM. But there is no such concept in other languages that have to support COM, like um, Java or C Sharp or, or VB again. So what is the solution there? It is type libraries. Type libraries, what are they? <coughs> they are a proprietary binary file format from Microsoft. Um, and years and years ago, there has been lots of work into uh, reverse engineering this file format, which is mostly based on the React OS uh, code base. 
Um, you can find the, um, the reverse engineered uh, typo specification right here, which is really good. <coughs> But what you normally do is uh, you don't reverse engineer it, you, you, you just create an interface in uh, interface definition language, of which I'll show you an example in the next slide, and you compile that with the Microsoft IDL compiler, middle.exe, and you just compile your interface definition in plain text to this proprietary binary file format. And this proprietary binary file format, it can either be a separate file, which usually has the TLB extension, or you can embed it as a resource in an executable or in the DLL. So what does IDL look like? It's like this. Um, <coughs> in this case, we are defining a, a, a interface, iSum, which is uh, derived from iUnknown. And we have a library statement here, uh, which is the basic keyword for introducing a, uh, a type library. Uh, it imports the, um, uh, the most important type library provided by, uh, by COM itself. And then we identify that we have a, a COM class, which is inside COM. It's just an example taken from, uh, from this website, <laughs> um, which supports the interface iSum. And what you then do is you compile this, this text with the middle compiler to a type library, and you end up with a binary file. So this is a file opened in the hex editor, and with a tool called thistyplet.exe, which is a very old tool, but it's still very useful, you can actually parse this uh, file format which has been reverse engineered. <coughs> so that is all genuine use of type libraries, but it turns out that type libraries can be malicious. And again, this is the work of Yang Yu, Tomb Keeper, and he actually demonstrated that there is this undocumented field in type libraries, which is called reserved seven. And um, this field is used as a offset for a V table, which is used in the COM API. And remember a couple of slides ago, V tables are just pointers to functions. So if we can mess with a V table, we can probably mess with program execution flow. And that is exactly what Young Yu demonstrated in 2009, and he gave a presentation at Kensec West in 2015. Um, and Microsoft's response was pretty easy back in 2009. They said, no, we're not going to, uh, to fix this. Um, <clears throat> so what does this look like in practice? <laughs> if, you, um, if you look at what's happening in a debugger, what you can see is that we have control over the ECX register through that reserve seven field. And then somewhere there is a call which we can influence through that register. Um, so we can influence a pointer to a memory address which is used to do that call. So in theory, we can influence program flow. <laughs> but try and do this on a modern Windows 10 system with ASLR, DAB, control flow guard, all embedding your payload in a type library. Um, I bet that some of you are way more advanced than I am in this kind of stuff, um, but this is really, really difficult. So fortunately, what um, Young Yu didn't realize back in those days, but what I've learned from uh, work by uh, James Forshaw, is that there's also alternative ways that we can use to exploit this load type like function on loading a type library that doesn't rely on memory corruption. And for that, we have to dive into the specification of the load type lib function. Um, somewhere in the remarks, there is this really interesting paragraph, um, <coughs> which says that, well, um, basically, if it's a standalone type library, uh, then we're going to, uh, to load that. If it's a resource in a DLL, then we're going to load it as a resource. But if the argument to load type lib library is none of these, then, the file name is parsed into a moniker and then bound to the moniker. This approach allows load type lib to be used on foreign type libraries, including in-memory type libraries. Um, and again, if you're not familiar with COM and you've never heard of the word moniker, you might be thinking like, what the hell is this? So let's dive into monikers. <laughs> and monikers, you could see them as um, objects which use naming to identify and bind to other objects. 
Um, I'll make it a bit more tangible when I get to the rest of the slide. But basically, there's this com API function in OLA32 DLL, which is uh, uh, MKPars display name. Um, and you give it a display name, and then it provides a pointer to an iMoniker interface by which you can bind to an object later. So what does this display name in stringified format look like? It's a proc ID and then parameters. <laughs> and there's different kinds of uh, monikers which are registered on your system. If you just go to the registry and you go to HKey classes root, um, and then you... Um, then you look at what is registered there, you will see PROG IDs, and some of these PROG IDs, they do offer the iMoniker interface. For example, there is the uh, display name, which is class ID for the class moniker, which means that uh, you can reference a class with that. Uh, there's a really advanced moniker for WMI as well. Um, so for example, this moniker, uh, it will provide you a object which is pointing to the C drive with the uh, impersonation level turned on. Um, so there's all kinds of monikers, but the moniker that we are interested in for successful exploitation is the script moniker. Sometimes also it's called the scriptlet moniker. <laughs> and if you are a bit into the work of Casey Smith, Subti, or Matt Nelson, then you might have heard of the script scriptlet moniker before. But what is it? It is a moniker to the Windows script component. It has this class ID, and there's the prog IDs, script and scriptlet, under which it is registered in the registry. So again, HP classes root, uh, then this class ID, um, then you will see there that this is the moniker to a Windows script component, and in the prog ID, there are both the script and uh, uh, scriptlet uh, prog IDs there. <laughs> um, this is all implemented by this DLL called scrubj.dll, and this scriptlet, sorry, this, this moniker, it takes a URL to a scriptlet as a parameter. So what we can do is, <coughs> we can just say script, and then give a URL or a local file or whatever, and this moniker will then parse this, it will load scrubj.dll, and it will eventually run this scriptlet. If you're not with, familiar with scriptlets, uh, scriptlets are a COM technology for embedding scripting languages as COM objects. So basically, an SCT file in this case, it can just contain JavaScript or VB script, which runs outside of a sandbox, which is exactly what we want. <laughs> but if we would hide this in our code, just an import statement which says uh, hashtag uh, uh, import as a preprocessor directory, and then this line, then someone auditing this code will immediately say, this doesn't look really good. So how can we hide our moniker better than that? We're going to use nesting of type libraries for that. <laughs> so what we are going to do is we are going to create a type library ourselves. And we are not going to do that with a middle, with the Microsoft compiler, because what the Microsoft compiler does is basically a, a console application around these interfaces for which the system provides a reference uh, implementation. Um, so we have the iCreateTypeLib2 interface. Um, if you want more details, visit this link, and it's very well explained there. But it allows us to create a type library programmatically. And we will create a type library which references another type library which you can do with the add ref type info method from the iCreate type info um, interface. <laughs> and we're going to reference a very long type library name. In this case, Ace repeated for, for how, I don't know how many times. So that we can later, either in memory or with a, a hex editor, we can change this AAAAAA with our script, scriptlet moniker uh, display name string. Um, when I first saw this trick, which was in the uh, exploit by uh, James Forshaw for CVE 2017, 0213, I was thinking like, wow, this is real magic. Um, in my opinion, this is one of the most interesting non-memory corruption uh, elevation of privileged exploits of the last couple of years. So have a look at it. It's a fantastic uh, com exploit. Um, but I use this method of script monikers plus nesting type libraries to build upon the work of Toomkeeper, Young Yu, to actually exploit compiling code 
without having to do memory corruption exploitation. So we now have basically all the components to, um, to do a short demo. So I'm going to my Visual Studio environment. This is Visual Studio 2019 running on Windows 10. And um, this is the developer command prompt because I want to show you that even when compiling from the command line compiler, this stuff is dangerous. So, well, so we have this code, which is, uh, which is evil. We put it in the middle of the screen. And as we can see, there's this import type lib statement right here. Again, it can also be on a UNC pad, web dev, or whatever. And if we just compile this code with the Microsoft command line compiler for C++, then we will see that, ta-da, there's calculator popping up here in this case. So compiling dangerous code is already dangerous. In summary, what is the flow that we just used here? So we have the Microsoft command line C++ compiler. It finds this import directive, and it means that it will call load typelib, in this case on evil typelib.tlb. Um, this is parsed by the com API, and it will find that this type library, it references another type library. But this reference to another type library wasn't just a normal type library, it was a display name for a scriptlet moniker, which load type library happily parses via uh, parse display name, and it will eventually bind to the moniker object, which means that scriptj.dll will actually run our scriptlet, and ta-da, we are there. Um, <coughs> What I've shown you here is Visual Studio, but there is much more attack surface to load typelib. Uh, load typelib is being used in integrated development environments like Visual Studio. It's also heavily used in MS Office in both the VBA editor and the engine, so there's a lot of attack surface there, um, which is redacted at the moment, but it will be a future talk and it will be fun CVEs. Also, there's uh, plenty of reverse engineering tools who do low type lib in one way or another. Uh, there's a com plugin for IDA Pro, for example. If you use that to reverse engineer code which contains a type library and you're passing it to that com plugin, then during reverse engineering you can get compromised. There's Ole Viewer uh, provided by Microsoft. Um, but also DLL Export Viewer by Nursoft, you might be familiar with it. It also has an option to parse type libraries. Don't ever do that uh, on your own computer when running that on an untrusted uh, uh, piece of code. And there's probably plenty of others as well. <laughs> How do you identify this attack surface? Of course, you can fire up WinDebug and uh, place, place hooks on the, on the right functions. But there's a tool which is really good at this which is API Monitor, it's a free tool. Um, and the good thing is that it allows you to hook on both COM API methods as well as interfaces provided. Um, it's, it's really, really easy. It can even automatically catch tile processes and you just use your computer, you have it running for a couple of hours and in the end you just go to the tool and look back at what uh, applications actually called low type lib in order to find this attack surface. <laughs> so this is all about compiling code. But we can take it a step further, um, and we can learn that also viewing malicious code can be dangerous. <laughs> How can viewing malicious code in an integrated development environment be dangerous? Well, most of you um, might think that working in an IDE and viewing code is just like a text editor. It is not. There's all kind of magic going on under the hood when you are working with code in an integrated development environment. This is also the big difference between Visual Studio and VS Code. VS Code is more or less this basic text editor, but the regular Visual Studio IDE, there's all kinds of stuff happening when you are just looking at and working with code. <laughs> Um, in Visual Studio, most of that works via MS Build. <laughs> and for the red teamers which are in this room, you are probably familiar with MS Build as a lolbin, as in there's plenty of ways to load malicious code via MS Build. Um, and you might have wondered, what is the actual use of this MS Build binary? So it's a crucial part in the uh, Visual Studio IDE. Um, and if you look at the specifications of what Visual Studio 
uh, does and how it integrates with MS Build, we can find this paragraph about design time target execution. And what it says here in a couple of lines <coughs> is that MS Build can be invoked already before the building process. So already on opening of code, the MS Build executable uh, can be tasked to run. And you do that with so-called MS build targets. You just identify them in your Visual Studio project file. And for example, a very basic example to have calculator pop up on just opening code is to uh, put this target in your Visual Studio project file. <laughs> If you are familiar with MS build targets and with the work of Casey Smith, up to you again, you will know that there are much more interesting examples than just popping up calculator that you can do with MS build. You can load arbitrary assemblies, whatever is there. But the thing is that this will stand out in your project file. If there's a developer who says, well, I want to review this project file before I'm going to open it in Visual Studio, it will stand out. It will look strange. So I wanted to find a better way to hide my backdoor in a Visual Studio project file. <coughs> and somewhere in the documentation, I found this hidden gem, which is the properties window. If you work in Visual Studio, you all know it. It's that little window on the right which provides properties on objects that you're working with. And looking at the documentation of that properties window, it actually says here that <coughs> descriptions, they might come from I type info, where the properties window receives it through get documentation. It doesn't explicitly mention it here, but as soon as you see I type info, you should think type libraries. I type info is the interface around uh, type libraries and getting information out of them. And apparently there is this thing called get documentation. Okay. Um, so what does that do? It does the following. If you have a type library, then there can be this, um, this tag, which is help string DLL. And help string DLL allows you to have help strings, which are just documentation strings, in a separate DLL. And this is being used for localization. So for example, if you want to support multiple languages, then you can just have a DLL which dynamically generates the help strings for you based on localization and whatever might be happening there. <laughs> so we can just create a interface definition language file like this. We can specify the help string DLL attributes, point to a arbitrary DLL. And then when a, when the function get documentation from the itype info uh, uh, interface is being called, which is exactly what the properties window does in Visual Studio, then it will just call load library, just so it will load it as a regular DLL, and it will call the exported function DLL get documentation out of the DLL, for which this is the signature. <laughs> um, so this means that the properties window can be our friend from an offensive perspective. If we can get the properties window to work with our type library, then we know that it will just parse this help string DLL attribute, it will load a DLL, and it will call an exported function. So we no longer have to work with scriptlets, etc. We can just uh, have our binary code in a DLL and get it to run through the properties window um, if only we can get a type library to load upon opening of code. So the question is, how can we do that? <laughs> well, fortunately, <laughs> there is a tag for Visual Studio project files, which is com file reference. And com file reference allows you to reference com files which aren't, um, which aren't registered on a system, which is pretty handy if you are working with CI, CD environments, automatic build environments, etc. cetera. Um, where the computer which is compiling the code might not have a certain com file registered in the system, so you can just provide it in the code base and have a, uh, have a successful build there. This is where com file reference is for. But we can use it to load a type library on viewing of code. And then after that, the properties window will do all the magic for us, and it will just load the DLL and then um, um, call that exported function on us. So again, time for a demo. So back to our VM. Let's just close all the calculators that we have. 
And right here we have this um, Visual Studio project file, evil project, and we're going to open it. And there we have the call to DLL get documentation, and there I have my code then spawning calculator again. So opening a Visual Studio project file can already be dangerous. What was the project uh, execution flow in this case? It looks like this. <coughs> um, oh, it says MSD++ compiler, that's not true. It should be Visual Studio properties window. Them. <laughs> um, which law does load typelib because of that com file reference attribute that we had in the uh, Visual Studio project file? That will parse a type library which has the help string DLL attribute and that will then just call our DLL which has this exported function DLL get documentation and we have our code execution. <laughs> so what's the impact of this? Um, since I'm a red teamer, I think like, how can I use this? One of the things is I could use this to go from a code repository compromise to a developer workstation compromise. It's like as in a lateral movement. Quite often we have had access to GitLab environments, for example, internally, and we could backdoor source code. But um, the, the number of systems where this source code would get, uh, where the compiled version of the source code would get run, that, that's limited. But now every developer opening this source code, we might already compromise his or her workstation, which could be interesting. And also in spear phishing, this might be interesting, especially because Visual Studio project files are not in the Outlook block list. Um, so you can just send a Visual Studio project file to a developer in whatever pretext that you have and just double clicking on that might get this developer compromised. So Microsoft response is still won't fix. They say, <coughs> code should be considered untrusted unless the developer opening it knows the source. And they have this famous warning message that when you have downloaded uh, um, the code from the web that you first get this warning message that I've just seen you. And we'll dive into warning message in the last part of this, uh, this presentation. Um, I started asking myself, is this really effective for everyday coding scenarios? Is this effective for how people work with code and under what circumstances might this warning message not be displayed. For example, downloading code is one thing with your web browser, but how does this work with a Git client, for example? So as a bonus, we will try to get rid of the warning message, which is based on mark of the web. So remember, this was the warning message. You didn't see it in my demos because I just executed a local project file. If I would have downloaded it, I would have gotten this, um, this error message first or this warning message first. And this warning message is mostly based on what we call mark of the web. <laughs> so what is mark of the web? It's not only used within Visual Studio. For example, also uh, MS Office heavily uses it. But the concept is that you have an alternate data stream on the NTFS file system level, which is named zone identifier. So look at it as a attribute which is attached on a file system level to any file. And this alternate data stream, it gets set by client software which downloads stuff or receives stuff from the internet. So for example, all major web browsers and all major web clients, they do adhere to this principle. <laughs> And it allows you to identify which files come from an interested zone. So for example, with this PowerShell one-liner, you can just retrieve this alternate data stream from a downloaded file, and you will see that it has a certain zone ID, which means in this case, the internet. And uh, on modern systems, we can even see from which uh, uh, URLs that this, uh, this stuff was downloaded. <laughs> so how does Visual Studio work with this? By default, if there's a project file which has this internet zone identifier, number three, it will display the warning message. And you can tweak this stuff under tools, options, trust settings. If you ever do a Google for this, there's plenty of developers who are completely fed up with the warning message and we try to get, uh, get rid of it in this way, um, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> so this is how it works. Now let's try to see how we can get rid of it. And in general, there's two strategies for bypassing mark of the web. The first strategy is to find a client-side application that does not set or does not 
propagate uh, the Markov the web uh, attribute and then deliver it in a format which is handled better at client-side software. A really famous examples are 7-zip, I'll get to it in, a, uh, in more details in a minute, and also, as I mentioned, the Git client, when you do a Git clone, it doesn't set this, uh, this attribute. Another approach is to use container file systems. Remember that the alternate data stream is an NTFS thing, then what if we use a file system container which doesn't have alternate data streams? And luckily we have virtual hard disks and the ISO format by which you can perfectly achieve this. So, some more details in the upcoming slides. <coughs> this is uh, the Git client, um, which is probably nowadays the most used tool for downloading code from, uh, from the internet, including from, uh, from GitHub. Um, and for understandable reasons, the Git client doesn't set this alternate data stream. Because imagine that you would be cloning a huge repository and you end up with all of these files having this alternate data stream and you have to remove them from all of them because your whatever IDE or other program that's doing with it is popping up irritating warning messages. Um, so probably for those reasons, the Git client doesn't set this mark of the web thing. So, if you ever clone a project from GitHub, you won't get this warning message in Visual Studio, but that doesn't mean that you can safely open the code. Please remember that. <laughs> um, when I told someone today about what kind of presentation I was going to give, uh, that person asked me, oh man, I hope you didn't backdoor your own code on GitHub, because I've been downloading that for the last couple of months. Um, I promise you, these tricks aren't on our, on our GitHub. 7-zip um, is another famous one, 7-zip, <coughs> the, uh, the zip client. Um, the thing is here, it doesn't propagate mark of the web. And by propagate, I mean that when you download a 7-zip file from your mail client or your web browser or whatever, it will have the mark of the web uh, uh, attribute set. And most other zip clients, when they extract that zip, they will propagate that mark of the web attribute to every unzipped file. For example, WinZip and the Windows Explorer uh, zip, uh, zip program, they all do that. 7-zip <laughs> is an exception to this. Um, it appears to be a conscious design decision by them, which I think is a little bit of a weird decision, but that's my personal, uh, uh, personal opinion. Um, if you want to look at the, why this design decision is there, just, just follow this link. But what they do is the following. When you double click a file in the 7-zip GUI, which means that the file gets extracted to the temp location, in that case, it does have the mark of the web attribute set. When you are extracting files to another folder, which you would typically do with a whole code base, you're not going to double click, but you extract it to a certain folder, then those files do not get the mark of the web bit set. Um, and if you're looking at this, remember that mark of the web is used in a lot of programs, including Microsoft Office with protected view, etc. So as a red teamer, you really might want to, um, to use this kind of stuff in your, uh, your attack scenarios. Uh, lastly, which is my favorite, which is file system containers like ISO or virtual hard disk. What you can see here is that the outside container, which in this case is proofofconcept.iso, this has the uh, alternate data stream set, which you can see by right-clicking and then looking at security. So it says here that this file comes from another computer, which means zone identifier. <laughs> and as soon as we look at the files within this ISO, we see that now this mark of the web thing has disappeared. So if you would now open this file, then you would get rid of the, uh, of the, uh, of the warning, which is based on mark of the web. Interesting stuff. Also very much applicable to Microsoft Office. Um, remember this feature that they announced a couple of months ago where macros will be running in a, in a Hyper-V sandbox? Um, also, that feature is based on Mark of the Web. So, use this kind of stuff here if you're uh, attacking that. Um, so, what are the takeaways for today? Well, first of all, there's impact on Visual Studio users. So, you should be really careful when you are compiling or just opening untrusted projects. And you might call me naive, but I have ignored this warning a lot of times after just downloading random code on GitHub. And I changed my behavior after this research because I learned, well, it's not 
only compiling and running code, which is dangerous. It's also just opening a Visual Studio project file, which apparently is dangerous. And as I've, as I have shown you, it's not just MS build tasks. It's also type library stuff, which you can do in there, which can be very well hidden if you do not know uh, where to uh, where to look for a pro potential backdoor. And for red teamers, I hope to have shown you that Visual Studio can be a very interesting attack surface. <coughs> um, most of the techniques that I've shown you today, they also work for other software, other environments. So all of the stuff around monikers and type libraries, James Forshaw has done an awful lot of work in the, in that area. Um, it also can be used in a lot of other programs. And there's some CVEs that I recommend you to look at if you want to get inspired about the attack service that's there. Um, there's a couple of famous ones in, uh, in MS Office, uh, which are these. Uh, there used to be a very old one in Internet Explorer, but the concept is so simple that I uh, recommend you to have a look at it. And then there's the magic by James Forshaw with this elevation of privilege, uh, which abuses uh, monikers and, uh, and type libraries. <laughs> um, and as I promise you, I cannot say too much about it now, but there will be some new stuff coming out in a, uh, a couple of months. Um, if this talk went a little bit too fast for you or when I've skipped over certain details, I will provide a blog post within a couple of weeks with a full write-up of this, uh, this talk and I will also publish all of the demos and code that I have used on, uh, on our blog. So keep an eye on it. Um, I'm a bit of a slow writer, so allow me like three or four weeks to, uh, to achieve this. <laughs> If you got completely inspired by this and you now think like, man, I want to dive into COM, this magical world, and I promise you it's, it's, it's a beautiful attack surface, go do it. There's a couple of books which uh, I can recommend to you. Um, they are all 1990s books, so you need to go to a web shop like Amazon which has a second-hand market to be able to still find them, but there is knowledge in there which is really difficult to find on the web, so printed books, they still have their value. It's inside com, essential com, and especially this one, which isn't an easy book, but, but it's really good on com and com plus. Um, go and read it. For tools, I've already shown you the API monitor, and again, James Forshaw has olyview.net, which is an excellent tool to uh, look into com objects, type libraries, and all the likes. Also, from his hand, there's this famous talk, which is com in 60 seconds. It's not really 60 seconds, it's 60 minutes, but it's a really good introduction to, uh, to come. So thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk and beware when opening Visual Studio project files in the future. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Stan. Any questions? So the speakers are aimed towards you, so it's pretty difficult for me to hear you, so. Uh, so at the start you showed, uh, uh, so basically uh, we had this thing where uh, we could execute uh, SCT files, right? So yeah. we can do that with uh, Reg SVR or uh, any trusted script like pub, uh, pub PN, PRN. So why would you want to use uh, loaded type, type loaded libraries? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so you're mentioning, I'll repeat the question, you're saying, well, we have this code execution through SCT files and we can always do that. Uh, we can also do that via other programs which consume scriptlets, yeah. um, like for example, RegSVR32, as you mentioned, definitely. Um, with RegSVR32, you can use it as a law bin uh, to load a scriptlet. Yep. Um, but it's a very difficult initial infection vector. Like, if it's cool that if you already have your implant running on a system and you want to run additional code, then you can use that law bin. Uh, but as an initial infection factor, that's more difficult. So that's why, for example, Visual Studio provides some attack surface for initial infection, and there we need this type library trick to, uh, to go all the way there. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other question? That's one. Hey, uh, great talk, man. Uh, Thanks. Hey, uh, have you tested this out against uh, uh, any of uh, the DRs and stuff, and how's that stuff reacting to, to what ah, you're doing? Ah, that's a good question. So have I tested this stuff against EDRs, etc.? cetera? Um, I've tested it against some of the uh, well-known AVs and EDRs. Um, <clears throat> 
The basic message is make sure not to reuse any standard components which are available in this world. So for example, if you take a malicious scriptlet which has been published on Casey Smith's uh, GitHub back in the days, then that will flag uh, AV and EDR immediately. Uh, but if you write your own scriptlet, then all of the stuff that's happening under the hood is just regular Visual Studio stuff. So it's pretty, pretty easy to evade uh, AV and EDR as long as you're not just so stupid to reuse standard GitHub scriptlets, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tran. Thank so you. Thanks for the knowledge you have shared. So uh, please have a great round of applause for the stand.